we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Andrew Weidenhammer. I'm one of the uh, conference organizers. You are in sparring with the security of a single page application or of single page applications with Dan Kirkendall. Um, a couple administrative items. At 12 o'clock, there's a women in AppSec event. Um, and so we invite everybody to go out to that. Also, uh, before you leave, there are two baskets back there. Both <coughs> have a green and red card near it. And so if you enjoyed his presentation, please take a green card and put it in the basket. If you didn't like his presentation, take a red card and put it in a basket. So with that said, Dan, take it over. All right, thanks. Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about uh, SPAs, single page applications, uh, and uh, mixing in a little bit of my, uh, my lifelong uh, love of mixed martial arts. Uh, so we're gonna be kind of talking a little bit about how hacking modern apps is very similar to the way uh, martial arts has, has evolved over the years. So we'll start off real quick. Uh, how many of you guys, how many, how many of you people have uh, watched any kind of mixed martial arts or, or remember martial arts? All right, lots of MMA fans. All right, cool. Uh, well, we're going to start off with a little bit. We're going to be jumping back and forth between MMA and, and web apps. And this is all about attacking, mostly. I'm not really talking about securing web apps. Uh, that obviously follows, but uh, I usually focus on the attacking side. So uh, very, very brief history. Mostly everybody should know this stuff. Uh, you know, in the beginning, web apps were pretty simple. Uh, they were, you know, generally pretty flat. Uh, the, the web was, was pretty easy to attack uh, when... Oh, and by the way, I guess I didn't even introduce myself. He did. I work at uh, Rapid7. I was, uh, we built a tool called AppSpider used to be called NTO Spider when I was with NT Objectives. Uh, so anyway, that's me. Um, okay, so web apps were pretty simple in the beginning. And everything was kind of based around HTTP. And it was a very simple standard. There was, you know, the simple HTTP uh, format, which was, the, you know, the gets and posts. And the parameters were name and value pairs, right? Name equals value. This is all stuff we've all known. We were all... Uh, most everybody here probably has uh, thanks to give to Rainforest Puppy, who kind of really got things started with uh, his, his article in Frack Magazine uh, back in 98, where he really kind of talked about SQL injection. He talked about a bunch of other web exploits. But uh, I don't know how many of you remember Frack Magazine, but I remember reading those little things all the time, the little, the little web pages that would pop up. Uh, but he really kind of talked about how easy it was it to attack uh, SQL injection and kind of hassled Microsoft about, uh, about the fact that they didn't think it was that important at the time. Uh, so yeah, if you ever get a chance to read it, it's still amazing. I, I read it again as I was putting this together and it was, uh, I was like, man, he, you know, nothing's changed, right? <laughs> the stuff is all the same. Uh, but SQL injection was pretty easy, right? In the, in, back in the beginning, you know, we do simple SQL injection attack, get errors back, and, uh, and then start doing some, you know, some nice little attacks, comment out the rest of the, the, the statement and get yourself logged in. Um, see, you know, web app security was pretty easy. It was easy to go and test. But we were also dealing with a very flat uh, type of application. It was a very simple application. Uh, and this is where it reminds me of, of martial arts, right? When I was a kid growing up, we had Kung Fu, Kung Fu Theater. Anybody remember that? All right, that was a blast to watch. Uh, and in, in Kung Fu Theater, it was all very basic. Uh, you know, most of those guys were all doing some striking. Um, but with martial arts, there tends to be these individual disciplines uh, is really kind of the history of, of martial arts. It was these different uh, disciplines. And, you know, we'd see karate, uh, we'd, you know, kickboxing. Uh, and actually, Karate Kid was actually kind of funny. Because they were actually fighting um, in, uh, what was it, uh, Kung Fu, right? He was actually fighting Kung Fu, but uh, since American audiences wouldn't know the difference, uh, Karate Kid sounded better. Um, and, uh, and Bruce Lee was fighting a, a model called Wing Chun, which is really like a, a lot of blocking and, and, uh, and intercepting attacks, uh, especially when he started, and we'll get back to Bruce Lee uh, in a little bit. 
But we had different disciplines, but every, every one of these different fighting styles or, or dis, you know, martial arts, they were all very different, but they were all pretty simple, and they fought each other, right? They would fight, you know, kung fu practitioners would fight with kung fu practitioners, and it was a pretty straightforward uh, affair, right? You would it'd have one dimension to this fight. Um, then there was a, an organization that popped up called the UFC that uh, decided to see which one was better. And uh, this is the original UFC, number one. Uh, and we had different styles fighting against each other. And they wanted to see which was better. And we had this Savat, which is like a French kickboxing, uh, versus this sumo guy. Uh, the Savat fighter actually won, surprisingly. Um, we had, uh, oh, actually, no, this guy is a boxer. I know I messed up the label there. On the left is the boxer uh, against the jiu-jitsu guy, which at the time in, what was this, uh, 2003 or something. Uh, actually, no, it was before that. Um, the jiu-jitsu, we didn't know about jiu-jitsu in America, right? This was a Brazilian guy, uh, and his family actually organized this first one, and they knew he was going to win because uh, nobody knew what to expect. So he beats the boxer, and the guy comes in with a glove. It's great. One glove on. Smart. Um, and then eventually the Savat fighter fought the jiu-jitsu guy, and jiu-jitsu won. And so they were saying, okay, theirs is better. And, uh, and it was quite a spectacle, and it was, you know, they called it no, hold, no, no holds barred, and it was pretty gruesome at times, and there was no real rules at all. Uh, it wasn't much of a sport. It was really a spectacle at the time. But what was interesting is, is we were focusing on different fighting styles against each other, and that was kind of a new thing uh, for the most part. I mean, things happened, uh, but it was a new thing. And even, even on our side, in APSEC, uh, we've had over the years some of these battles of which style of attacks are more important, right? We'd see, uh, you know, this is the OWASP top 10 as it's evolved over the years, and you can see things moving around. Um, you know, cross-site scripting, I think on the first one was uh, number four on the first top 10, and then... Uh, Let's see, wait, cross-site scripting is kind of, yeah, it went up to number one, then it came down to number two, now it's down to number three, and I, there's, a, there's a new one, right? Um, but it's evolved, right? And our, our understanding of these attacks and what matters has evolved. Um, and, and this is still within a fairly flat application model, right? And the, you know, for basically, you know, since the late 90s till, you know, just a few years ago, Apps were pretty flat. They were pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Uh, but going back to, to martial arts for a second, there was a, a desire to start understanding, you know, we had these different fighting styles, but people needed to start to understand all of them. And we had to get a little bit more multidimensional in, in, in martial arts. And, and Bruce Lee, uh, he ended up creating uh, Jeet Kune Do around this philosophy where he wanted to uh, break away from one style, right? And, of course, you can kind of put your Bruce Lee accent in your mind, right? It, uh, Jeet Kune Do, you know, favors formlessness so that it can assume all forms. And since Jeet Kune Do has no style, has no style, uh, it can fit with all styles. Uh, as a result, Jeet Kune Do utilizes all ways and is bound by none, and likewise uses any techniques which serve its ends. So... He really was, he wanted to mix, he wanted to understand every style, understand everything. Uh, you know, he unfortunately died before he was able to get to see what we have today uh, with, mar with mixed martial arts. And mixed martial arts, by the way, is just martial arts mixed. We got all the different styles in there. Uh, and it's a sport, UFC is a league, for those that don't know. Uh, UFC puts on MMA events, so kind of like the NFL puts on football events. Uh, so with fighters, they have, uh, when, you're, when you're looking at what a fighter is doing, and uh, they have to start concerning themselves. Now, if you're, you're taking different martial arts styles, and you're blending them together, and you're going to fight somebody else, right? You're up against somebody else that uh, is a fighter. There's generally a few different levels that you would see in this fight. Um, usually, you start off standing. You're at a bit of a distance. Uh, that's where... Boxing or kickboxing would generally play in, some Taekwondo, uh, but you're generally punching and kicking at distance, right? And that's one, one level of the fight. You get a little close, 
uh, you start getting your hands on each other, you're still maybe in striking range, uh, there's a, a style called Muay Thai, which would come into play a lot of times. So that's elbows and knees, because you're up really close. Uh, you have these kind of different stages as you're engaging in this combat. Uh, you know, you get closer, you start getting your hands on each other, you're grabbing each other, you're getting into grappling, wrestling, uh, judo, you're trying to throw the person, you're trying to, you know, there's a, uh, you know, American wrestling where you're just kind of dragging them down generally, trying to get into some kind of dominant position. Uh, and then eventually you get on the ground, and that's where jiu-jitsu, like the first UFC, jiu-jitsu comes in play, and, and that's really about submissions. And there's a, I know there's a lot of jiu-jitsu practitioners among the AppSec community. I think uh, Jeremiah kind of got a lot of people uh, reinterested in it. Um, and it's fun. It's all about submissions, and it, there's a lot of detail, and it's a very thinking uh, style. You really have to be very thoughtful, and, and you're always having it as a chess match. You're always having to think several steps ahead, uh, and it's a lot of fun. But a, a modern uh, mixed martial artist has to be well-rounded. They have to know all the different styles. Uh, otherwise, they're going to get in trouble. And so that's what's happened. That's how that has evolved over the years. Right? Over the last, whatever, 20 years, uh, the, the, the fighters in the UFC have really evolved into being well-rounded fighters for the most part. And just so you know, there are lots of details. I'm kind of naming some of the, the high-level techniques. And this is a bit of an eye chart. But uh, within each, there's a lot of different variances uh, that, that you would possibly engage in or techniques that you could learn uh, when you're up against somebody else. So uh, what's been fascinating is to see how well they've really started to adapt and understand they have to deal with all these different possibilities, all these different possible problems, and, uh, and they've, they've adapted to it. So how does that fit in with, with AppSec? Uh, AppSec has really evolved as well, because web apps have evolved. Web apps are no longer just HTML-based, uh, and, and things have really evolved very heavily, especially the last several years. I would say the last four or five years, it's been dramatic how apps have changed. And, and I don't think most practitioners, most security practitioners, have kept up. Uh, so, you know, first when JavaScript came along, it was uh, fairly benign. It was generally used for things like, you know, menus and, and whatever. Uh, you know, and it was doing some client-side activity, makes, usually it was for some visuals. Uh, but that has changed, right? When, when Google Suggest, and this is still a while ago, when Google Suggest came along out of the Google Labs, uh, <clears throat> and we started seeing Ajax really in use in a practical way for the first time, uh, this started changing everything. We started seeing that the browser, instead of reloading a page, would turn around behind the scenes and make some request to an API and get data. Um, and, you know, now Google suggests it's just how Google works, right? It's just always suggesting. Um, but this was how we started and how things started to evolve was <clears throat> on things like this, on uh, big steps. And our apps became much more dynamic. We went from these very flat, static-looking kind of web pages uh, to very dynamic applications that look very much like what a desktop app. We thought Things that we thought only could happen in a desktop app, how dynamic and... and uh, the user experience that could only happen in desktop app came to web apps. But it came because of how intense JavaScript started to become, what it, what it made possible, uh, and then all of the APIs behind the scenes. Right? If you're using Gmail, uh, it's doing a lot of things behind the scenes. You're, you're clicking on a message, it's going off and making a request behind the scenes. It's calling up an API of some sort. Uh, and these have been called different things over, over time. You know, web services, RESTful APIs, web APIs, uh, a lot of people just call them uh, re just APIs. Uh, usually when you refer to a web service, people think of SOAP. Uh, there's all these different formats that this data can be in. And this is where people start to get in trouble because we don't have just this standard model as the dominant player anymore, um, you know, where you have that simple name and value pair. And so as an attacker, it's very easy for me to you know, isolate these parameters. There's plenty of tools out there. Uh, you know, I can use 
you know, burp proxy or a zap proxy or whatever. It's very easy to attack this stuff. Um, there's plenty of tools available to make it very easy. But all of a sudden, when I'm dealing with APIs, the data formats change, right? I could have, you know, the parameters may actually, um, the, the directory structure with the URL, <coughs> uh, those could be parameters, right? I could have XML data. I can have JSON data. Uh, Google Web Toolkit uses pipe delimited format. Uh, old school AMF used a binary format, right? Uh, all of these formats all of a sudden start breaking most of your tools. And, and a lot of people still aren't aware of this. They, they go and test things um, with automated tools and realize that they're, and they don't even notice that their automated tool isn't covering this in many cases, right? Unless the tool has been updated to start supporting all these formats and understanding what's happening behind the scenes, then we're not actually attacking them, okay? Um, and you have to. You have to really attack these things properly. Right, I've seen a lot of times you got this JSON string, um, and I'm sure everybody's seen JSON or used JSON in some form, but how well are they actually testing these parameters? What ends up happening a lot is I'll see you know, a JSON string as the, the post data, uh, or it's like input equals in this long JSON string, uh, and most tools are just seeing that as one long string. And you'll end up seeing the attack delivered like at the end of the string. Right? So it's like input equals in this JSON string, and it's just basically attacking the end of it, or it's going to do nothing. Right? The JSON parser, actually in many cases, once that last squiggly bracket hits, it's going to ignore everything else. Um, or it just may break the parser, and the parser is just going to fail. Right? But you actually haven't accomplished anything. And so you have to really start digging deeper. You have to start understanding that this requires a little bit more intelligence. I need to individually attack each of these parameters. I have to make sure that my attacks are escaped appropriately for JSON. So if the JSON has double quotes, you know, I need, I need, and I'm going to need to inject a double quote, I have to escape it properly. I have to function well within that structure. So I have to start to know it. I have to know what it, how it works, what is JSON's, you know, format exactly. Uh, you know, if it's XML, if it's Google Web Toolkit, whatever the format, I need to know it well. I need to be comfortable with the format, with modifying it, attacking it. I have to have tools that understand how to deal with this format, right? If my app is using this and I don't have testing tools that can support it, it's not really helping me very much, right? But you have to start digging in. You have to be sitting there watching the traffic as you're clicking on an app and seeing what's going on. What is all this traffic? What are these API calls? What's happening behind the scenes? Um, and if you're using a lot of these APIs, uh, one of the challenges is discovery. Um, one of the things that we see throughout everything is that uh, with all these tools, with any kind of testing, you can't attack what you can't see. If I don't know something is there, if I don't know a, a resource is there, I'm not going to attack it. Um, and so, you know, with, with traditional web apps, you know, it's just crawling the app can be difficult. Uh, especially if you're using automated tools and all of a sudden they have custom 404 handlers or they got some Ajax activity, they've got um, forms that have to be populated in a specific way, otherwise you don't get through them and onto the next thing. You have a, a defined workflows where it's like a shopping cart, right, where you have to first add an item to the cart and then deliver and then, you know, you do your, you hit checkout and you get your, uh, your shipping info, your billing info, and along the way you can actually attack, maybe you can attack the billing info page, but the, the payload's not going to show up. Let's say a cross scripting attack or, or a SQL injection attack wouldn't happen until you complete an order. You have to be able to test through this whole process. There's all of these challenges that we're going through. If you're dealing with the REST APIs, well, even if I'm clicking around this app and I'm triggering stuff, I may not have full knowledge of it. Uh, REST APIs, uh, you can't really crawl. Right? I don't know if any of you have tried testing web uh, REST APIs. I don't know what do you guys do, right? We'll have to maybe open that up in the Q&A. But most tools don't support testing these APIs in any real useful way. You need some way to uh, discover what's there, right? With our tool, uh, with AppSpider, we actually support importing Swagger documents. Um, you know, there's RAML, there's API Blueprint. There are ways that people can document their API. Most people just document like in a Word doc, which is terrible. It's not going to help you. Um, 
If you're doing manual testing, I guess it could help. But if you're trying to automate any of this, those a Word docs not that helpful. Uh, it, how many of you are familiar with Swagger? A lot of you. Great. How many of you are actually making sure that they're getting implemented? <laughs> a lot less hands. Um, but if you do, then there are tools like ours that can actually import a Swagger document and then understand, OK, here's what Swagger is, for those that don't know what Swagger is, it's a, it's a, a format for documenting an API. So it would describe, OK, there's this method available, and, and these parameters are valid for it, and what data types they are. So SOAP, for those that remember SOAP, SOAP had a WSDL, a web service description language. Uh, and it was a, an XML document that described what was available in SOAP. And, and SOAP actually was very naturally, they were, they were kind of married at the hip, which was great. So if you had a SOAP API, you had a, a WSDL for it. Uh, and it were auto-generated for the most part. Uh, REST didn't have that. REST is a very loosely defined format. It's just kind of, uh, I guess the only real rule is that you, you respond with some programmably usable data, right? What the format of it is is wide open to interpretation. Uh, and so because of that, it's, it's up to somebody to document, hey, you, here's, all, here's how you talk to me, here's how you give me data, and here's what I'm going to give back. Um, so if you don't have those kind of techniques in place, you're not going to get a good test of that API. When you're trying to discover, when you're going back to the crawling, and you're trying to discover a web app, and you're starting to deal with a very dynamic client, Right, with all this Ajax activity, uh, for an automated tool, it's a beast. Because it's like that map in the labyrinth, right? That, that, the, the, the maze that she goes through, right? The, the lawn maze. It changes. If you remember the movie, it changes as she's going through. She's going over here, and all of a sudden, where she just went, the, you know, the bushes move and whatever. And now she's going to get totally lost. Well, that's what it's like for an app scanner uh, that is trying to test a web app or any you know, automated tool that is testing a web app. Uh, in, in scanners these days, and we, we did this very early on, most scanners do this, uh, most commercial scanners anyway. Um, tools like Burp or Zap, they don't really harness a client the way we do, but um, what most commercial dynamic scanners will do is actually take the page, load it in a browser object, and trigger the events. So imagine, and this is kind of how our tool basically works, imagine a scenario where we load up the page, right? We grab it and we pull it into a browser. Uh, Chrome, IE, Firefox, doesn't really matter. We load it up into a browser object and we could sit there on top of the DOM and basically puppet master this thing. We can look at it, we can examine what, uh, what events, what JavaScript events are registered with the, with the different uh, elements on the, in the DOM, right? The document object model. So I'm looking at that and I can actually see, okay, this has an event. I can trigger it see what it does, right? It might hide or show, you know, hide or unhide something. Um, I don't really care. But if it, if it causes, if there's like a form that is going to get submitted when I trigger this event, well, that's good. Now I know that there's this form that is available to attack, uh, this post I can go attack. It might trigger off some Ajax call that's going to go call a RESTful API, right? And now I can see, I can actually monitor that XML HTTP request and monitor it and see what happens. Right? But as I'm doing this, as I'm triggering events, the DOM just changed. Right? I moved things. And all of a sudden, the DOM was this. And now it moved, and it's changed to this. So I have to keep track of all the generations of all these DOM events. It becomes a real challenge for automated tools. Uh, and this is the kind of thing I have to deal with every day. But, uh, most of you won't. You guys are just probably manually testing or using somebody else's tool. But um, these become the challenges. And you have to make sure that your tool is up to the task. Right? or that you're up to the task of being able to keep up with all of these things that are going on. Um, we start to get to the point of SPAs, of single page applications. And uh, this is kind of Ajax to the extreme. right? And, uh, and well, it's no, relax for, no relaxation for me. SPAs are, are a nightmare for automated tools, quite frankly. Right? Um, and I think they're a, they're a nightmare for pen testers. Uh, they're, they're a huge hassle because they take everything to the, the extreme, you know, you essentially have one page that loads up, or a stub in a lot of cases, you have like some stub that loads up, and, uh, and, and then it just changes. The page is dynamically moving and changing behind the scenes. Uh, that DOM is being updated. 
uh, you know, instead of going from one page to, you know, I click on the, my profile page and it takes me to that screen, it's now just modifying itself. The one page is there and it's just modifying and, and, and evolving. Uh, and so this becomes a real hassle. Um, you know, again, going back to Gmail, tools like this are very dynamic. It's a very great user interface. I don't, I'm not against SPAs from a user perspective. It's a fantastic model. Um, because it, it really can create a very uh, clean feeling application that, that really is comprehensive uh, and, and very, you know, the user experience is great. So we're going to keep going that way, I'm sure. Uh, it, it's just clearly a better model for, for the, uh, the user experience. But from a code and, and a testing model, a security model, it's a nightmare at times because it's really complex. It all of a sudden makes things very uh, difficult. So uh, how many of you are dealing with some kind of spy applications in your environment? Okay, a lot. Um, maybe that's why you came in here, right? Uh, these become a real challenge. And, and, and I'll tell you that there's some things that most, most people don't fully understand about these. These frameworks, uh, there's a lot of different SPA frameworks. Uh, and I had kind of ignored a lot of them for a long time, so I was like most that you know. I mean, other than I, you know, my developers were using certain ones. Um, you know, I'd see Angular being used here and there. I would use, you know, I'd have some of our dev teams would be using it. Um, React had popped up, uh, and we were working with a customer that uh, their applications were all React. Uh, they had, they had, they were uh, among the team that actually had created React. Um, and so they, they had a lot of stuff dependent on it. And, and we would run scans, and they wouldn't work very well. Or, or the testing was not very comprehensive. And so we had to start digging in. So I started looking at React, and, and my research team started looking at it. And one of the things that we found, you know, as we kind of looked into it, some of the details uh, started to cause some problems. Um, so for those that aren't familiar with React, it was created by uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, as their model for kind of doing spa uh, activity. It's used by lots of big companies. Um, it makes heavy use of APIs. Like, it, it, the way it sets everything up, it's very dependent on doing a lot of API calls, uh, a lot of RESTful API calls. Um, but one of the things that it does in particular, and I'm going to zero in on, is it implements something called a virtual DOM. So uh, most people know what a DOM is here, I would think. But for those that aren't, a DOM, and I described one earlier, it's actually the way a browser looks at your web page, right? It actually parses all this HTML and, uh, and loads it up into this document object model. It's an uh, object-oriented structure uh, of the page. And so that's how JavaScript actually modifies it. So uh, that's what a normal, the, a normal DOM is. The React virtual DOM actually essentially abstracts away the real DOM uh, from the developer and gives them this simpler DOM. I don't think it's that much simpler, but whatever. It, it, the, the theory behind it is that it's a more simple DOM, uh, and it's easier for the for uh, for React to kind of manage uh, this and, and give developers uh, functions to register with this DOM. And, and part of it is because um, usually when you're doing, uh, for those that have done this, when they build web apps um, and you're dealing with with the DOM. Sometimes browsers behave a little different, right? So if I want to register something with IE, it's a little different than it is with Chrome at times. And there's little annoyances. So you have to write in, like, you know, browser checking, right, all over your code. Uh, React would actually kind of, you know, this virtual DOM abstracts that away because they'll handle that sort of thing for you. Uh, but now the, the code is dealing with this virtual DOM, which then interacts with the real DOM, OK? So when we were actually doing our testing, um, it, it broke the scanner. It basically was breaking our model, where our scanner would load. Remember I mentioned earlier, we, did, we could load up the page, and you could execute the events. Uh, well, we did that by looking at what events were actually registered and then executing them. Well, with the uh, React, uh, you know, this last bullet here, uh, the virtual DOM registers one event with the, document, win the, the window document, right, which is basically the whole page. Um, and it just registers that one, so that anything that happens calls into this function, which then React and their virtual DOM then decides, oh, was that an, e an element that I care about and all that sort of thing. 
Uh, but I only had one event. You know, our scanner only had one event to register. So we had to start looking at it. And as I dug in, I started to understand what's going on. Um, and of course, we added support for our scanner to support it. But that's really beside the point. The, the thing is that I, didn't even, I wasn't even aware of this concept and how people were using it. And this is a very soft touch version of it. There's a lot more that goes into React. Uh, for those that are you know, React developers out there, you know there's a lot more. Um, but it starts to pose interesting new problems uh, for pen testing, is these frameworks all of a sudden make everything like, it's like magic. It's crazy. There's so much that goes on. There's no way you're going to be able to parse it and understand it. Um, so you have to start getting in and understanding what are the things that this framework is doing? How is it making it different? Uh, what possible security implications are there in the way that this thing functions? You know, how are they taking data? Is it, you know, some of these spot frameworks make cross-site scripting very, very difficult or, you know, nearly impossible to actually uh, accomplish as an attack because everything's coming through RESTful APIs and, and it's, it's kind of sanitizing it in the JavaScript. So that's maybe good, but are we putting too much uh, of the logic into the client? Maybe, um, you know, maybe those REST APIs are wide open to attack because the developers are focusing purely on the client side activity. I see lots of these APIs that are like wide open to very simple attacks, right? Simple, you know, it's like Rainforest Puppy just applied to a simple JSON format, right? And wide open to attack. Uh, but you have to kind of start to understand all these different layers, right? The apps are becoming more and more complex as we go through. Um, you know, React was very difficult. It added a ton of difficulty to the, the, the client side, right? And understanding what's going on in this client side. So all of a sudden, my client side skills have to get beefed up. I can't just focus on simple HTTP. I have to understand you know, what's going on with these different frameworks and, and the ones that are being used in your environment. Uh, you have to get really comfortable with the REST APIs and understanding what's going on with the REST APIs. How are these being protected? What's available? Uh, and then don't forget mobile. Right? All of a sudden, now we move and we start having not just traditional web apps, but we have mobile at play. Uh, for the most part, you know, in, in AppSec, mobile apps uh, themselves are, are well tested by static analysis tools, um, but they all use RESTful APIs. Right? And so for the most part, if you've got any kind of mobile app, it's turning around and talking to a service. So there's more REST APIs all of a sudden. That's web. Right? That's a, a web service. So uh, you, know, you need to be able to get in and see what that traffic looks like. What are those calls? Um, again, we're going back to similar to like the, the SPA frameworks. They have REST APIs. Well, so do mobile apps. And sometimes you have to actually get in the middle, do some man in the middling uh, you know, between the mobile app and its web service, look at that traffic, um, start testing it. Uh, mobile apps are, you know, again, very cool in that they're using a lot of RESTful APIs, and we can test those, um, again, with a lot of the tools that we're all comfortable with. You can test a, you know, REST API with, with a BERT proxy, or you can use automated tools like ours. Um, but they add in a new layer of complexity. right? And one of them, again, when you're looking at REST APIs, especially when you're using mobile, is all of a sudden you have web service authentication to worry about. So again, oh, crap, I got something else to be a problem. It's, you know, still sometimes you'll have the classic, uh, you know, HTTP auth I see a lot uh, for protecting REST, you know, RESTful APIs. Uh, you've got, you know, standard custom headers. You got cookies. Uh, cookies we're all good with, right? It's like, all right, I'm comfortable with cookies, so it's good. Um, problem is they don't use cookies very often. They're using something more complex. Uh, they might be using OAuth. Uh, uh, OAuth is a... Is kind of an open standard for setting up authentication, uh, and it has its own headers and things like that. Are you, anybody you have to deal with OAuth? Yeah, OAuth is a great technology and great uh, uh, design for the most part. It's great, but all of a sudden, if I'm testing an app that's using that, oh, great! That's adding all kinds of complexity because OAuth, there's a, a handshake that constantly goes on. You know, I'll, I'll authenticate with the OAuth service. Uh, and I get a token, and then that gets validated when I go use the app, and there's this whole cycle that goes on. But you have to now get comfortable with that if I'm going to be testing, 
right? Because you don't want to just assume, oh, well, it's got OAuth for the authentication and session management. Well, the, the, the web service may be vulnerable, but now I can't even test the darn thing, right? And I see some that use like a custom uh, solutions. I've seen lots of uh, web services over the, over the years that actually use a totally custom, altogether custom technique, right? Well, they'll use like, this one it actually says authorization header, but it's not the old uh, uh, HTTP auth. They have like creds and then Joe user uh, semicolon and, and a hashed password, or yeah, it's actually a hashed password um, or token actually. Uh, and this one, all of a sudden, I start looking at this REST API and how they come up with that token becomes interesting. I start looking at the code and I say, oh, okay, I have a name, you know, I have an API key, and, and then it'll like have an expiration date for this request. Um, and then they like create, you know, they have like the verb, they set the, the expiration, they end up doing a, a base64 of an HMAC um, API key. They do this whole bit of code, and I have to start figuring this all out so that I can actually deliver a stupid attack, right? And, um, and so you have to start battling it out. And then imagine doing this over and over for every attack. This is where you start to need automation. You need some automated tool that will do this crap for you. Uh, but again, if you don't know, if you're not paying attention when you see this REST API and you start delivering attacks and they're just getting rejected or you're not seeing anything, it may be because you're not even getting requests that work. Uh, a few years ago, I was uh, at the... Uh, uh, B-sides alongside RSA and was doing a live hacking demo, right? And uh, and I was, you know, I set up a, um, uh, a Wi-Fi pineapple, right? And, um, and so I had it up and running and I was looking at traffic flowing through and there was Twitter traffic, right? And so I started zeroing in on this Twitter traffic that's going on and the uh, and so I, you know, I'm, I'm zeroing in, and then I'm doing this live, so it was you know nerve wracking. But um, as I'm going through it, I see this Twitter traffic, and I can replay the requests. So that was kind of interesting. It wasn't letting me modify it though, uh, because they were signing the, the the structure. They weren't letting me to modify, but I could resend that tweet a couple times, um, and then after a couple, then the server would say, "Hey, you're retweeting, right? Or you're just repeating a tweet." And so they kind of start the APL start blocking it. Uh, but one of the requests was actually the um, the direct messages, right? And Twitter, that's supposed to be private. Um, but I can actually keep replaying the direct message request and get any new messages that showed up. And of course, people in the audience re realized who I was, who I had hacked at that point, and started sending them some tweets that were showing up on screen that were fun, um, or some direct messages. Uh, but I was able to keep replaying this. So some of these APIs. Even a simple replay attack could be kind of interesting, right? Uh, I uh, again, I couldn't. I could modify the tweet a little bit. I was having some fun. I was trying to play with it a little bit in real time. Uh, but it was interesting because, like, in the middle of doing this, all of a sudden, somebody in the audience stood up and said, "Like, no, it doesn't work that way." I was like, "Well, we're doing it right here," and uh, and it was actually the head of Twitter security, right? <laughs> Um, and apparently he had just earlier in the day done a talk about all their cool new security mechanisms. Um, and so he, he ran up on stage and looked at it, and it was actually an old API that was still up and running that this uh, Plume Twitter client was using. They hadn't migrated to the new API, and he's like, oh, crap, this one was supposed to be disabled, but I guess it's not, right? Because the new one actually would sign every request so that you couldn't do a replay attack. Uh, so there's things that they're doing, people are doing out there to secure these formats. That doesn't necessarily mean that the individual parameters then being sent or received couldn't be attacked, but a, the authentication and session management makes it more difficult. So now that becomes a hurdle if I'm trying to do a pen test. Now a hurdle's a good thing, right, because that slows down a, an attacker, but it also slows down you know, any kind of legitimate testing. Um, and so again, you need tools that support this. Um, we, we support this sort of thing, but... Um, it's, uh, it becomes an issue. So again, uh, remember I had a little chart earlier with the, uh, the different fighting levels, right? And you had all these different levels that, you know, a fight could start off, you know, standing at a distance and you're in striking and uh, boxing, kickboxing range. Uh, well, similar to us, for us, is we have all these different layers that are a potential thing that we have to deal with. You know, we're, we're, we have the classic HTML, that's easy, that's nice to, 
comfortable striking range. Um, I guess if you're if you strike, um, you know things get more complex on the client side. You got these really rich APIs, um, you know, rich, rich clients. These these SPA frameworks that that can really make things difficult. You have REST services or web services, RESTful APIs, um, and all the different formats. And you have to get comfortable with all the different formats. Um, and I see some custom formats from time to time. Right? It's like Bob in the office didn't like JSON for some reason, and so he wrote his own, right? the Bob format, and, uh, and so you're stuck with it. Right? Um, so you have to get comfortable with all these variations of things that might happen. Um, and then you have authentication layers. So there's all these different layers, and so we can't be um, you know, one-dimensional anymore. We have to be very dynamic. Um, you know, I saw this pop up, jumping back to MMA for a minute. Um, this guy, Sage Northcutt, uh, popped up onto the scene, uh, came off of some TV show the UFC was doing, uh, and, uh, you know, has the look um, of a model, quite frankly, but, uh, you know, he looked like a fighter. He kind of actually looks like Guile from uh, Street Fighter uh, with his hair, and this actually doesn't even, his hair actually is a lot more like Guile these days. Uh, but this guy, he came on the scene, he was flashy, he had all these crazy kicks he would like to do. Uh, and in his, in his kicks and his, his striking was amazing. The problem is, he was one-dimensional. As soon as somebody got him on the ground, you can see that panic in his face because he was immediately choked out, right? He was not a well-rounded fighter. If you're not a well-rounded pen tester, you're not a well-rounded security professional on all these different layers, um, you're going to you're gonna, you're gonna get hit an app that you're not going to be able to test. You're not going to have the skills. You have to start learning, right? The well-rounded MMA fighter, um, knows all the different techniques, knows all of the things going on with application development and how apps are being developed and what all the different layers are involved. And so like them, we have to become well-rounded AppSec professionals and understand all the different layers so that we can actually test them, right? Uh, you know, like Bruce Lee, going back to him, don't pray for an easy app, pray for the strength to hack a difficult one. He didn't actually say that, he said... Uh, easy life and to endure a difficult one, but uh, I like it this way. Um, but we have to start to understand all these different layers, all the different challenges. When I'm dealing with a SPA application, it all of a sudden introduces all these layers to me. I have to start dealing with all of them. So uh, anyway, that's primarily it. Thank you all very much. I ended a little early. I went a little fast, but um, it gives us some room for questions, Q&A time. But uh, hopefully this has been useful information. Uh, I guess my biggest message is make sure you're just learning all those different layers. Uh, you can't just focus on one. Your, your tools that you're using today may not be serving you well. You have to make sure that you get the right toolkits. Make sure you're getting the right tools to help you along the way and understand the weaknesses of each. But um, anyway, any questions? Go ahead. Sorry. If someone is a new pen tester, where would you suggest they start? Oh, dear. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I guess the biggest thing is understanding. So whenever I'm trying to hire somebody to do, to do security research or, or testing, I focus on trying to find web developers. I need somebody that knows how apps are being built. Um, and so I would start off there, understand build something. If you've never built something and you're interested in security, maybe you're coming from network security, um, and I've had this, I'll hire somebody that was kind of a, a network security guy, so at least he had the mind of a security per person, I'd force them to do some web development. Go build something, see how it works, see the different layers. Um, you know, just a little simple project. You know, we, we built this tool called Hackazon, which is a little web app, um, just so that it's like a storefront. I had interns over the summer um, and I would have them build a little store, an online store, and I would just hack it. And I would show them, like, here's where you did something wrong. Here's where you did it wrong. Here's where you exposed, exposed this sort of attack. But build something, see how they're being built, uh, but get close to developers and understand what they're doing. Um, that'll give you your weakness. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Sure. The rest is easy, quite frankly. It's just tedious. <laughs> it's, like, seriously, it's not that difficult to do a lot of these attacks. It's just tedious. And so you got to get through, you know, you just got to be like, just go, go, go. But understanding all the different techniques 
obviously is important. There's probably a good 20 techniques that you really got to know. Um, and once you know those techniques, then you can generally apply them anywhere. And just, again, sometimes being aware of the fact that I, I'm supposed to attack these areas is, is important. But that's, that's a big key of it is just the, atta the attacking techniques aren't that hard. Like you can go on OWASP.org you know, and, and see the different, um, you know, there's not a lot of new categories of attacks, quite frankly. Like cross-site request forgery was probably one of the most interesting new ones that popped up over the years. And, and even that's kind of a tricky one. But um, there's not a lot of new attacks. It's just the tediousness of, of applying them into all the right areas. Yeah. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about discovering some of that unadvertised functionality out of you know, all that complex JavaScript and stuff like that. Do you have any suggestions on that if, uh, if it's not going to present itself in the normal use of UI? Yeah, so for, I don't know if everybody can hear him, but he was talking about Ajax apps uh, or response apps uh, where developers are really relying on the fact that they've blocked the usage of it in the, in the client side in many cases. Because uh, you don't have the right token, or you have not the right, you know, there's not the right setting in your profile a lot of times. Uh, and this is where I had mentioned briefly, uh, like things like Swagger. A lot of times, it's really the web service calls that matter ultimately. And so, if I can discover what functionality is on the API, if I can get a Swagger document, if, especially if I'm doing legitimate testing, and I can go and try to, you know, within an org or whatever, and I can go to the developers and try to get some of that information. Then that's where I get some of these unadvertised. What he was, he was the term he was using, the unadvertised functionality. Um, you know, a lot of times, even mobile app. I'm clicking around a mobile app, and I, I, I may see a lot of the calls, but I don't see everything. So that's where something like a Swagger document or API Blueprint Raml, whatever your your, your preferred format is, uh, if you can get something like that, that then it tells me all of the different pieces of functionality. That's where I have to do a lot of it. But getting access to some of the unadvertised functionality is very difficult unless you dig into code. Hey, Dan. We got one back here. Yeah. So I have a question. With um, you know, with regard to some of the NoSQL databases and stuff that are coming up, like Mongo and, and Couch, um, I know there's some open source projects that are out there now that are kind of, that are great, that are, that are getting going, but nothing really stable, it seems like. Um, do you recommend anything for um, like a SQL map type I know there's NoSQL map, and then there's the NoSQL framework. But are there anything that you've used that you recommend for testing kind of the, the NoSQL backends? Uh, yeah, I've run into the same issues. It's the very limited, um, even manually testing these NoSQL databases are a real pain. Uh, I don't know yet. I really don't. I mean, there's it's it's something that we're trying to figure out ourselves on on our on the testing side. Uh, there still is, you know. You can get rid of SQL, which it'll take forever. SQL is going to be around forever. But um, you can start to start phasing out and going moving over to, to like a NoSQL structure. Um, it still leaves all of the, the, the business logic flaws are still then become your big, you know, again, this is where you pivot, right? If I can't attack SQL directly or I can't attack the database with SQL, then I'll pivot and I'll start looking at business logic flaws, right? Those are still going to be there, right? If somebody's not checking to see if when I go to you know, the profile ID equals 10, and that's my profile, and I change 10 to 11, and I see the next person's profile, like those business logic flaws are still going to be there. And NoSQL doesn't change any of that. The only thing it changes is I can't do SQL injection directly. Uh, but I haven't seen a lot of good tools for, for testing. I'm going directly to your question. I haven't seen a lot of good tools for testing that stuff. Um, still research to be done. So you. Um you mentioned all the challenges of testing single page apps and REST APIs and how to do it manually, but are there any tools that do this well today? Um, so I think our tool does it very well, uh, or pretty well. Spas are hard. And uh, like, you know, we added support for, for React. Uh, we're, in the, we're in the process of doing it for Angular, and, and we're going to keep going and do like Ember, I think, maybe next. Uh, 
you know, we support RESTful APIs. A lot of this stuff that I talked about, we support in some form or another. Um, I won't say it's perfectly supported anywhere. You know, it's like, this is a very difficult problem. Uh, so, you know, sometimes it's not just one tool. I think our tool from a DAS perspective is probably done the most that I've seen uh, because we've really been focused on all, all these different areas and making sure we have some support for each of those different problems I talked about. This is stuff, you know, our, our dev team is going over all the time. Um, but sometimes it's a mix of tools, you know. If I, can't, if I can't test it with a dynamic scanner and I may need to do static analysis over here, in some cases I need some hybrid approach because there's stuff going on. It's the right tool for the job, but uh, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, from a DAS perspective, you know, App Spider is very good. Are you saying that NoSQL is uh, safer, more secure, because you can't attack something you can't see, or you don't have a right tool for it? Uh, I think it generally is safer. It's just. Uh, Obviously, it depends on what you're, you know, not everybody can use, no, no SQL doesn't fit every problem, right? SQL is still a much more versatile tool, but uh, I think it is, it, it, it appears to be more secure. It's still relatively new, so we'll see, right? There may be some fundamental flaws that we just don't know about yet. Um, you know, when SQL first was in use, people weren't thinking about SQL as a, fun, SQL injection as a fundamental flaw. We just haven't maybe popped it up yet, but for now, it seems to be a pretty good model. So I had a question. Um, for the traditional apps, uh, uh, web apps, usually fingerprinting is easy, as in like you know that there is a .NET framework by seeing just seeing if it is ASPX, and uh, for Java, like .do or .action, what have you. But for uh, REST API things, do you, I mean, um, I have not found at least a tool which actually can fingerprint it well. Uh, no, they're, is, they're custom. They're individual custom APIs that are being developed. So. Yeah, but we can't crawl a REST API either. I've no, a lot of times it's like, you know, site.com slash REST slash V1 or something, right? And like, okay. And I, if I make a request to it, it just is going to say unsupported function or unsupported method or something. It's not going to tell me anything. So I can't crawl it. So that's where Swagger, API Blueprint, uh, RAML, those things are hugely important. If we can get, you know, we, I, we work closely with Microsoft. Uh, and they they have this this problem with all their REST APIs as well, and and you know they had like these government auditors in there uh, some time back, and they were asking Microsoft like, what do you do about your REST APIs? And and uh, you know and this is when we were still kind of developing our our support for Swagger, and uh, and they called us. They like they said, well we'll get back to you, and they called us and and uh, said, what are we doing? And I told them about Swagger and what we're doing and. And it had to refresh them. We had already been talking to them about it. But they knew, so they knew that we were doing something. And so they went back and said, oh, well, we're going to be you know, testing it with our, our tool from Rapid7. And, uh, and they asked the auditors, what are, what are other people using? Right? Because th these are auditors that are testing you know, doing audits of very large companies. And they were, what, are, what are the other companies doing out there? And they said, well, actually, nobody's got a solution. We were hoping you guys might. Right? Um, so... Uh, we see a lot of it, and, and so what they've done is they actually are now in the middle of going through all their org and telling all the groups, like, if you don't have a Swagger, if you don't have a Swagger documentation of your API, you might get it pulled, right? And they're, tr they're starting to go through and enforce that people document their API in, in some format that would allow testing to take place, right? All right. So what do we do to scale this up when there's a new JavaScript framework every day? Like, <laughs> you know, because besides digging into identifying the framework, assuming that it's, it's an open source, publicly available one, and, you know, seeing what vulnerabilities there are, that's a huge ramp up time if you're in an environment where either, like, you see a lot of different customers or, you know, you're, you're in a company where people are allowed to do whatever they want. Like, so what can you do? I guess, for, for kind of like triage analysis, the likely points to go after, or figuring out things like, oh, this one uses a virtual DOM, so my old techniques won't work. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you'll notice pretty quickly. Uh, it's a good question, is, is these things are popping up. We actually have a, a research project going on right now, so we can start figuring out, like, which frameworks are really popular, like, actually being used. So at Rapid7, we have a project that actually called Sonar that scans the internet, like, is it every week or something? 
I think once a week or so, we scan the entire internet. <laughs> um, not for vulnerability, we're not doing attacks, we're just crawling it essentially uh, with, you know, from a network scanner perspective. Um, but we're looking at, we're trying to figure out which ones are the popular, which to focus on. But if you're in an organ, you just don't know, or you're a pen tester who's hitting you know, the C and you're, you pop in, the only thing you can do is, is monitor the call, see what's going on, and, and hopefully have a toolkit that gives you some, you know, a versatile set of tools, right? Some of it, if you have an automated tool like ours, if you're using a burp proxy or a fiddler or whatever you use, app proxy, whatever you're using, understand its weaknesses and where it's not going to solve things and then where you're going to have to try to figure it out. Like, you know, if you know the limitations of your tool, then, then you at least know what to work, what, where your gaps are going to be. So that's, that's the only suggestion I would have there is understand the tools you're using, what can they actually cover? The rest is going to be just up to you. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And remember, there's a Women in AppSec event being held at 12 in the Lafayette room. Uh, and as, as well, make sure you grab a card and put it in one of those baskets uh, before you leave. Thanks, everyone.